Hey everyone, today I'm joined by John Merges. He was a bookie for the Chicago Outfit for many years. During John's career as a bookie, he met a lot of made men and bosses of the Chicago Outfit. Me and John discuss his encounters with Frank Calabrese, Nick Calabrese, John No Nose De Stefano, Joe D'Amico, Joe Ayupo, and Nick Gio. There's plenty of other guys that he talks about, but those are just some of the names that stood out to me. Another interesting thing that me and John talk about is that his father had an encounter, and it wasn't a good one with Tony and Michael Spilatro. Please hit subscribe if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into John's story. Hey John, how you doing man? Good Adrian, how are you? Pretty good, man. Thank you for coming on my show, and I'm really interested in your story. I mean, it's going to be a hell of a story, man, so thank you for coming on. My pleasure, buddy. So, it's the least I can do for a friend. Yeah, well, uh, I think the best way to talk about your life is, you know, going to your early life, and we'll work up on our way to the criminal aspect and, you know, leaving the life, and now what you're up to today. <laughs> well, yeah, I, um, I was introduced, and, and most of my life encompasses around... Um, sports betting. And so when I graduated high school, um, I knew some uh, friend. I had some friends that um, introduced me to a gentleman who was um, unfortunately killed um, by turning on um, the Chicago outfit, co cooperating with the FBI. But he was the, his name was Jimmy LaValle, and he was who introduced me to the life of, of sports betting. And he was involved in other aspects of organized crime. But, you know, he was the guy who I, um, kind of mentored me and, and got me into that business at 18 years old, um, the summer of 1981 is when I got started working in a dirty warehouse with a, a bunch of guys answering phones and um you know just running a, what basically is considered today you know and back then an illegal sports betting operation yeah no and i know even before all that happened too as well your family had encounters with the chicago outfit and i mean i i mean if you want to kind of talk about you know your family's background as well i think that'd be good to throw in there, you know, too, because, you know, you, your father had dealings with Tony Spilatro and, you know, your grandfather, I think at one point was kicking up money to pay protection to the outfit and stuff like that. Is that yeah, pretty much everybody, you know, this is, you know, my grandfather back in the late forties and fifties, um, you know, he was, he had a grocery store on state street, in Chicago. Um, and you know, everybody on the block or blocks or basically in the whole city, you know, was was kicking up for protection. You know, they'll they'll keep your windows from being broken and you know things like that. But um, you know, he he was just you know a regular guy that you know had to do what was required of many people, especially business owners. Um, you know, I've done my homework on the, the history later on. You know, now in life. Um, I find it really interesting to watch shows on on the mob. Not a lot is, not a lot is 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 out there on the Chicago mob. You'll see a lot of New York stuff and the mob in general. But you know the Chicago outfit is is was a lot different. Still still is what's what remains of it. Um, it's a shell of it of it what of it what it once was. You'll have to excuse me. I'm, battling the flu while we do this interview so <laughs> no, I'm right throat or him, drink of water <laughs> yeah so so i mean like yeah the chicago outfit was definitely different and when they i mean i mean i kind of want to expand a little bit on your grandfather's interaction i mean do you think they really offered any protection at all or was it protection from themselves really <laughs> it was just protection from them you know these guys yeah. were but they were so damn powerful you know no was not an accepted answer or any right. wavering. So, you know, it was just expected of it. So that was his dealings. As my father, growing up in a neighborhood, um, you know, living in the same building as the Spilatros at one time, being much older than, you know, being older than Tony, I think my father was in for the military and, and my uncle was, you know, you know, a, a much younger guy. And not only is Tony, but Michael beating up 
my uncle and my father looks out the window and sees my uncle getting his, his ass kicked and um, just goes down there and Tony's the first guy he, he saw. And this is, you know, little kid Tony Spilatro. And so my dad was pissed off. He, he hit him over the head, you know, with a baseball bat and never told that story until they found the brothers, you know, buried in a cornfield, which in Chicago, you know, nobody really knew how they were found. And it's pretty, now it's, it's out there. Um, I mean, each brother's genitals was stuffed in the other one's mouth. I mean, That's you, you can't get more, bru- yeah, you can't get more brutal. Um, the guys that killed them, well, they, they, they have an idea of who they, who they are now. Um, but, um, everybody's pretty much dead. I know some guys that are still alive, um, that I see, you know, they, they have a Chicago organized crime chart, but even that, I mean, I look at it and I, and I know it's, it's not right. It, it, and you know, the FBI can come to me and I don't know who's really on it, but the people they have on it, I mean, some guys are actually dead and it doesn't see, say deceased. <laughs> Wow, so they they are still doing some catching up then. That's for damn sure on trying to figure out who's who and what's going on. I mean, they probably don't really I mean, you you were way way we were really close to them and I think the way we'll get into that is like we'll we'll keep going with your early life and then, you know, get into you sure. know when you're doing the with the bookies and stuff, but you know with your father his uh I mean, did they ever find out like what your uncle and you know, Tony and Michael Spilatro were fighting over or were they were trying no, to do that? It was like, you know, kids out in the street, you know, it was a tough Greek and Italian neighborhood or Italian and Greek neighborhood. But um, um, it was on um, people that had been to Chicago near Greek town, Greek town and the Italian neighborhood were basically were next door to each other. Um, and because they were very similar in ethnicity and ethnicity and, and just um, interests. They were all, you know, fruit vendors, vegetable vendors, grocery store owners. Um, and, but, you know, the Italians in that area, I mean, you knew back then, as my father would tell me later on in life before he died, never told me a lot of when he was alive. He just told me, you know, to be careful, you know, don't say anything, don't talk to anybody. Um, he was a lawyer. So he did give good advice. And so I never came, you know, I was approached by the FBI at a, at a young age, probably a couple of years after I started, because, you know, they have their eye out um, on what, you know, what they're looking for. And, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, they were really trying to infiltrate the Chicago outfit. And so, of course, my father growing up with a lot of these guys, came, you know, w- was approached on many occasions to see if he can help him out with the legal issue. And in some cases he would, you know, um, he was offered right out of law school, um, guys that he knew from the neighborhood, you know, they were looking for in-house, you know, attorney and they offered my father a job, you know, working, um, strictly for them for much more than he was making as, as a young lawyer. And he turned him down. He said, no, I enjoy what I'm doing and I want to keep doing it. But you know, if you ever need help in certain areas, I'll be more than happy to help you. (laughs) I bet that was, uh, they probably didn't want to hear that. I mean, did they step off or did they try to muscle him or at all? No, they didn't. He was, you know, because he was a neighborhood guy, they knew him. You know, he was a straight guy, um, honest man, well-respected. So, um, you know, they kind of gave up. He didn't tell him no. He said, you know, hey, on some occasions, if there's something I can do for you that, that's, you know, in my specialty, which, you know, a little criminal he dealt with, mostly workman's compensation. But when it came to those guys, it was all criminal. Right. Um, I had an issue um, that I haven't ever talked about before, but it was back in um, – 19 probably right before i i got into the bookmaking business i must have been a junior in high school i was 17 years old 
and I was driving and my, I had a Trans Am back then, a 1979 Trans Am that I still love to this day. I wish I had it. <laughs> um, I'm with my girlfriend. I, we kind of get like run off the road pretty much by a guy in front of me. So at 17, of course, uh, you know, I'm, I'm full of, uh, you know, just everything, <laughs> um, <laughs> piss and vinegar mostly, but <laughs> yeah, what will, what happened was, um, I chased the guy down. Uh, we got a high speed chase. He ends up running off the road. I run to his car, I open the door. I'm like, what the, you know, what were you doing, man? You know, what are you thinking? I hit him a few times. It ended up being a guy. Um, and I won't see his last name, but his father was a political um, reporter for lo the local NBC station, which hmm. would be Channel 5 in Chicago. Um, and he was a polit political, a well-respected political reporter. Um, a few days later, I got arrested for battery. Um, and there was, you know, it, it wasn't good. My girlfriend did get a cut in the head because I had to slam on the brakes um, because this guy cut us off. But that said, it was a very um, difficult time. My father came home, and the one thing that he was pissed off about after I got ar arrested was that, yeah, the judge wants $10,000 right <laughs> off the bat. First thing he tells me. I mean, these people were so corrupt in that city. And I won't even mention the judge's name for his family's benefit, but they were all, well, let's face it. Um, I don't know if it's gotten any better. I live in Florida now. From what I hear, it hasn't. But the corruption was just amazing. So they were definitely on anyone's payroll, certain judges. Oh, yeah, all the judges. So they would have, like, the lawyers, like your father, like they would have the ones that they wouldn't know that, they, hey, we can do this back – backroom deal with this judge and this lawyer and anybody that he represents will work out a deal and we'll, we'll lessen the charges kind of thing. Absolutely. I got, I got it lowered from, you know, battery and felony battery, whatever the, I can't remember the exact charges, but battery was one of them. And for the 10 grand, I got six months um, supervision, not even probation, nothing, um, <laughs> no felonies. You know, my father was really big on, you know, never get a felony and the, we'll get into it later, but the business that I was in, you know, carried a felony charge if you were arrested doing it. And so to this day, um, I've never been, uh, I've never been convicted of a felony. We'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, <laughs> you had the the right judges on the payroll, I suppose. <laughs> Up in Chicago, yeah, yeah. I would imagine if that's that's how it was. I'm sure as you got more involved with the outfit, it became more accessible. Would you say? Yeah, corruption on judges, cops, and oh yeah, stuff like that. The you know? '80s and '90s. I moved down to Florida in '95, but from '81 to '95, um, from what I saw was just pure corruption alderman um i was at at, at, at at events um one gentleman pat marcy um he was the political fixer i dated his niece for a couple years and got a chance to meet pat marcy um it, he was a very respected man a made member of the chicago outfit and his basic duties were to arrange everything that the mob asked for. It's nothing, you know. Now, the city would ask the mob for favors, but the mob or the outfit would basically tell the city what they need to do. And Pat mm -hmm. Marcy, um, I believe he died during his trial, but eventually it caught up to him. It caught up to a lot of these guys when they were in their 80s. Because most of the old timers, I mean, they were really big on driving used cars. You know, yeah, they wore suits, but everybody did back then. Um, but keeping a low profile, something I learned in life. What I learned is, you know, not from the younger guys, but from all the older guys. Yeah, they they definitely probably inst wanted to instill that in a lot of guys instead of trying to be flashy and you know, that's going to cause attention and stuff like that. I think I definitely would say with the Chicago outfit, from what I've researched, 
they were a lot less or they were more quiet and less flashy than obviously like the New York families and, you know, John Gotti kind of deal. But so I'm, I don't know if when, once you started getting deeply involved and stuff, I mean, how, how were you? Did you keep a low profile or were you flashy? Yeah, I did. I did, you know, because, um, you know, I had guys to, I had people to answer to being of Greek heritage, you know, I was never going to be one of them. Right. But I was going to be associated, which I was. I was associated with them, and I was, I was, uh, you know, I was trusted. Um, t- you know, to this day, I've never really mentioned any names that um, could come back to somebody or somebody's family, um, because I know for a fact that you know a lot of the guys that were involved when I was, um, you know, taking bets, um, their their children got into, you know, became doctors, lawyers, professionals. The last thing the Chicago guys wanted was for their children to be involved in in what they did, right? Um, especially the guys that were, um, and let's face it, all the old timers they got to where they got by being ruthless. You know, it was nothing, and it is to to, to this day in different factions. Um, you know, you have other other um, backgrounds that are. Involved in illegal, you know, business from South America to Europe, that have weakened um, the whole La Casa Nostra. I, 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 like I said, I believe it's a shell of of what it once was, and so that's why there's guys like me and, and bigger. I mean, I watch uh, Michael Francesi and mm-hmm. JC and you know the rest of them, Sammy the Bull, you know, yeah. do interviews, and you know these guys were actual killers. Yeah, they were. I mean, so yeah. that's what makes it. I mean, that's why they get the views and they really are, you know, interesting to listen to. I mean, because people, the everyday people, they're to them, it's like, holy shit, how can, you know, someone do this? And But it's like intriguing to them and they want to listen to it and watch it. So it makes for a good storytelling and, you know, it definitely people enjoy it. So, I mean, especially with the whole mafia aspect in it, too, they were a different breed of criminals <laughs> i guess yeah and you know with the way things are now i mean you know society's changed and um i you know i, I read somewhere there hasn't been a mob killing in new york since 2014 or 16 Damn. <clears throat> which amazes me so yeah it's a long time without you know and in, in chicago i maybe even longer well you um, did bring up an interesting thing i mean because I mean, I'm sure if you follow the mafia news, the whole thing in Montreal, Canada, yeah. did you see yeah. that attempt? So, I mean, they're, so they're still, they're still doing shit like that. So, what was your thoughts on that? I mean, did, I'm sure, I don't know if you had any encounters or anything with the Canada mafia or anything, but no, I mean, not what, really. What was yeah, your I'll, thoughts on that going down? Well, it's then? interesting, you know, the the the, the Canadian um, that you know that faction of families, um, and and it's um. It's a family in, in Montreal, just kind of like how Chicago's run. One family, not that five family. New York, in you know, they're all, they're, all, they're fighting, they're killing each other, or they were killing each other for territory in New York. And Chicago was one family, yeah. one boss, and a bunch of captains. But in Montreal, you know, these guys were working heavily with biker gangs. Montreal mob was known mostly for um, importing drugs. Um, especially heroin from Italy. Um, you know, they had more, it, it was Canada. It was easier to get things into Canada than it was in this country. Our, our, our um, you know, uh, DEA and, and it's much stronger than anybody else's in the world. And yeah, yeah the technology, I mean, look at the Colombians and, and uh, South American um, drug dealers are still using those wooden submarines. I mean, you know, <laughs> bringing tons of cocaine in. Yeah. So, but, I mean, it's um, definitely different from the U S and Canada and everywhere yeah. else, you know, but no, I thought I'd just get your two cents yeah. on that, you know, no, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's the Canadian mob and there is a mob in Canada and it is people of Sicilian, you know, descent. Right. That's what mostly Chicago was New York. I mean, yeah, you could be Italian, but you know, they prefer, you know, they prefer the Sicilians. That's where it all began. Right. That was the origins. Yes. So, what, what, okay. So, after you started becoming a bookie, w- before you were with the mob, you would 
be um, independent bookie. Is that what you would call it? Or label no, it? you know, like, yeah, when I was in high school and stuff, you know, taking guys' bets, but, you know, okay. it was few and far in between. It was, it was getting introduced to, you know, there were independent bookies in Chicago, mm-hmm. but you better make sure that you have a sponsor, um, somebody that's in the organization that's in charge of all that. And then, and then those independent guys would pay X amount of dollars a week, depending, you know, a lot, a lot went into it. You know, the guy had money, the guy had a good customer base. You'd have to be pretty transparent when they came to you. I, on the other hand, worked at a bigger organization, um, which was right downtown Chicago, where they were able to, and, and, and they found it was easier back then because you could have several bookmakers with let's say 30 40 50 clients and that and that's a lot of clients for one guy um and all the bets are coming in to those phones that you're working at and you're writing everything down and there's line managers um walking behind you and they could see your sheets you know and you kept separate sheets and if you got a big bet for let's say you know a big bet back then would be two dimes two thousand dollars and so you'd write it real big, two thousand, and the team they had because everything was done on, with a with a pen and paper, and they'd look at it, and then they'd pass it on to the guy in front of the whiteboard, saying, you know, I just took two thousand in, and the one thing you don't want to be in a book is you you don't want to get one sided action because now you're becoming a gambler. You're trying to even that you know even those odds. As, as everybody who, who bets knows. And so it was real important for them to see, you know, down the line and across where these big bets were coming in and on who. And they'd have it up, you know, they'd have numbers up there. We had different systems we used. Um, but unlike a lot of bookmakers, we were lucky because we had security. We had off-duty Chicago cops that kind of, you know, protected the warehouse. So we never really had to worry about being um rated unless it was the feds you know the feds were different those guys didn't take they weren't on the payroll no (laughs) okay so what i was going to ask you is you could even out the odds i mean can you expand on that a little bit for me and other people that don't really know what that you know i mean i know what a bookie is but i mean to the day-to-day kind of operation and stuff really interests me i'd like to learn a little bit more about that Sure, isn't you know most of the big. Um, let's just use NFL football as the easy, easiest example. So, you know, to win a hundred dollars, you have to bet one ten, and, and the the ten dollars is basically the big. Um, it's the juice, and that ten dollars is what bookmakers are after. Is that that ten percent? You kind of just want to. And it's it's not always the case, and a lot, a lot of times nowadays it's not the case. That's why they have risk rooms and risk managers and guys that just, you know, they work with other books and they try to because if you get one sided, let's say, um, let's say you've got uh, the Kansas City Chiefs playing the uh, Miami Dolphins and it's in Kansas City, and the spread is Kansas City minus eight. Um, and you get and you start getting everybody likes Kansas. Oh, I like Kansas City minus the eight. And so the majority of your bets are coming in on Kansas City minus eight. Well, you've got you know what you have to do is you've got to try to you know get rid of some of that risk. So you make them eight and a half, trying to see if you can lure some Dolphins action in. Yeah, you get a couple little dolphins action. You're still heavy on the Chiefs. You know, you you uh, you make the Chiefs nine. Now guys, sharps come to come out and hey, you know, that number's nine, nine and a half. And so then you get more money on on Miami. Now what we did was we worked with other cities, including New York, but in New York we had to use an intermediary city, which was usually Pittsburgh, sometimes Cleveland. Because they had strong, powerful factions of their own. But Chicago and New York, they were pretty much enemies. Um, And so 
we would be able to, you know, books in Miami, you know, had people betting the Dolphins big. We were able to either lay off that money to those sports books or we had guys, runners in Vegas that had cash on them that would be stationed at the bigger sports books in the 80s, the Mirage, Caesars, and they change guys up every week. So we just look like some big guy in on vacation laying $25,000 or $50,000 off um, on Kansas City. You know, that, 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 that overlay. That's what you wanted to, to lay off. You just wanted to make your 10%. You didn't want to become a, a gambler, you know, as a bookmaker. Yeah, okay. No, so that, that does, you know, expand it more on me. So that does make sense to, you know, you really want to get that 10% so you can make, start making some profit and then everyone else gets it. What is the – so you, when you guys collect that 10%, I mean, how much are you getting paid? How much are the bosses getting kicked up? What does that look like? Yeah, um, that was pretty private what the bosses were making. I mean, we knew they were making a heck, you know, a heck of a lot of money because we were collecting a lot of money every week. I mean, to this day, the actual number is, in the, and this, this has been good a good number for a while, about 97%, and I might be being generous, 97% of betters over the long term are going to lose. It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, sports betting is one of the hardest businesses um, or hobbies, and that's what it is for a lot of people nowadays, is a hobby, which, you know, you just can't win. You know, I mean, you flip a quarter a thousand times, it's probably going to come up heads 50%, you know, 50 yeah. times, to, you know, 50% and tails 50%. Yeah. So, um, but I was making as a young guy, a thousand dollars, four thousand a month, five thousand a month. Damn. You know, it would vary. I'd get a little. You know, I'd get bumps and bonuses. Um, a lot of free drinks at bars. I mean, you know, no health insurance, but like free <laughs> drinks at bars, um, free lap dances at strip clubs. You know, th things like that. You know, the nice perks. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you're nineteen, twenty, twenty-one years old and single and not married. I mean, what's, you know, for, for a young guy, what's, what could be more fun than, you know, having <laughs> drinks at the strip club for free, <laughs> for free. Yeah. So, I mean, with, with that being said too, what was the eighties and nineties is when you're doing it. So, I mean, the money was quite, quite a bit more than compared to today. Wouldn't you say? Oh yeah. The guys, the guys. Um, today that you know actually maybe the sports book directors the guys that manage the sports books out in Vegas, or all over the country for that matter now yeah i refer to vegas a lot but as as, as it's expanded sports betting in general mm -hmm. um there's you know guys everywhere and a lot of the guys i see or hear of and you know i use twitter as my social media platform pretty much and you know we'll dm or i'll text guys and there's a, a lack of um, a, a lack of knowledge in these individual sports books um, outside of Vegas. Um, the people that run it, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but there's some business models that, as I see nowadays, are just don't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, you definitely from when you were doing it back then, it's got to be different from today's. But I mean, you you were there. From the beginning, I mean, how many years have you been doing it now? Well, I've been betting for the last 20, you know, oh, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe 17. Um, I stopped bookmaking in 95. Things were getting really hot in Chicago. I had right. a bad feeling. Things did go down the year, the year after I left. Um, some things happened. People got busted. Um, but it was just, um, it was the wild west of, of, of bookmaking. You know, I made a lot of trips out to Vegas as a young guy, and that was it. Um, as I said, Rob Mish, the um, author, columnist, um, did a piece on me maybe a little over a year ago. And I basically explained, you know, what it was like. And, you know, it was, it was the, the wild west of, of sports betting. It was hardcore. It wasn't, you know, today, this is gravy, man. You go and work in a sports book and, every, you know, nobody's coming in to arrest you. They're coming in to bet. 
Right. Then and I know with loan shark or not with loan sharking, but with be- sports betting bookies, you know, it comes loan sharking. I mean, and then did you ever have to go and collect money, or did they have guys that would do that for you, or how'd you get yeah. collect people's debts and stuff? Well, we, you know, we had an agreement. You know, a guy would be down. You know, we'd meet. Hey, listen, if your number hits, you know, if the guy lost fifty bucks, I'm not interested in meeting that guy. I have enough people to collect from that week. So, you know, we'd set a number. Usually, you know, three hundred dollars, um, five hundred dollars. Some of your bigger players. Hey, listen, if you're up or down a thousand dollars, or you know, or more, then then we'll meet. It made it a lot easier because it was hard to see thirty-five to forty people a week. Yeah, and I'm sure. Most of the, yeah, most of the time I was just collecting. You know, that's that's how much people would lose. But the people that would, you know, win, um, yeah, meet them, pay them, um, and uh, it was it was a, it was a pain because you know I had to drive around all week. You know, and those are days. Some days I'd have to go from the warehouse to go meet guys in the suburbs and traffic and, and then get back to the warehouse for the later games. Um, and you had guys cover for you and stuff, but it was almost, you know, it was seven days a week. That was the thing about it. You know, you work seven days a week. You rarely got a vacation. I would imagine with all the, <clears throat> the calls, the driving, <clears throat> collecting money. I mean, so yeah, I'm sure it would have had up and, you know, be seven, and then the, all the sports games that are going on every single day. I mean, it's it's probably not even just sports. I mean, what what? I mean, were they just betting on sports like boxing, fights, football, soccer? I mean, just everything. No, so, no soccer really. <laughs> um, yeah, we didn't take soccer. But horse racing was big. Horse people, racing. yeah. Um, I had some customers that I would get for horse racing. Um, I wouldn't. I, I did it first, but. You know, we had guys that specialized. You call it the horse guy. And, you know, it was easier for them to keep track. And um, another reason was those guys, you know, had to work the hardest. Some days, you know, there wouldn't be – there'd only be a couple baseball games on. But the tracks would be open. And so those guys would have to work. So it was kind of like one of my strategies not to take too much – you know, too many guys. And and whoever I brought in that that wanted about horses – I just passed them off to another guy. Let them deal with it. <laughs> yeah, let them deal with it. I had enough to deal with. Right. But then you know, I, I get a little bit. I get a little bit older, and you know, things change. You know, like anything else, any other job, you you, you get to move up. Yeah, and I think uh, if I read right, you, we were twenty seven when you became one of the twenty seven years old when you became a manager. Is that right? Yeah, they finally. You know, they. I, I've been there enough. They brought other guys in. Um, you know, I, I kind of proved myself that I, I could handle it. So I became one of the line managers. And, you know, that was a big responsibility because, you know, now, you, you know, it's you. You can't miss a guy that's got, you know, he's, you know, hit his pen. Look, 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 I just took $5,000 on this side. Then I got to go talk to the guy in front of the whiteboard uh, or chalkboard even. And they're putting the numbers up there in front of us real big so we can see. Because when the guy calls, he's asking. I'm, I'm looking in front of me on the phone, you know, old school phone. Yeah. And, 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 you know, reading off the lines to him. And if this guy lays $2,000 down, and we're, we're still real heavy on that one side. The guy's taking the guy, the guy on the board's rubbing it off, putting the new number up there. So it was a lot of responsibility. But with the responsibility came the higher pay, and that's when life started to get really good. You know, I was making excellent money. Um, you know, and most of my friends, um, except my very close friends, um, didn't know what I did. Um, really? I just, yeah. My my wife didn't find out until gosh, I was dating her for. It only took her four months, but four months. Know, I yeah, say, she, damn, I was gonna say years. I'd be like, "Holy shit!" Oh no, no, I just, <laughs> you know, I gotta leave. I gotta go out. And, yeah, know, all the time. And I had this no-show county job, which was kind of my cover, so that <laughs> I would, you know, the only thing I had to do with that job was go in in the morning and sign in, and they'd see me. Oh yeah, he's working. Then he came and signed in, <laughs> and then somebody would sign out for me. Actually, I paid somebody to sign out for me. They 
they got my signature down really good. I, I, I just scribbled it, you know, but like a V. Right. And they would scribble a V. And that's my signature. To this day, I have pretty much the same signature. Very Damn. easy to copy. <laughs> so then, I mean, how many years were you able to work that job? Or I, I suppose not work, but make that job work for you. Well, let's see. You know, I had that job from about when I became um when I became just before I became a line manager. So I think about actually right after, because I was playing college baseball. That's another chapter in the life there where, you know, I decided as being a bookmaker, as working with these guys that I decided I wanted, I wanted to take a couple cl classes in college and see if I could walk out of my local um, junior college baseball team, which I was able to do. <clears throat> I turned that into playing a year there and then enrolling in the University of Illinois at Chicago, which was basically right down the street from the warehouse. <laughs> so all my classes were in the morning. And then, um, and I took the, you know, I, you know, I, I took the classes. It wasn't, you can't take four classes a quarter. I believe we did quarters back then instead of trimesters. Mm -hmm. And so I would take the maximum, but my first class was like seven, seven in the morning, right after baseball practice at five thirty when baseball season started. Baseball practice was at five thirty a.m. just for like conditioning and workouts. Right. Well, the guys in the warehouse thought I was a nut. They're like, "What do you want to go to college for, man?" I said, "You know, to play baseball." Like, what do you want to play baseball for? You got a good gig going. I go, "I'm going to keep my gig, but I want to go to school." Well, there was some times where, you know, like road trips and stuff that kind of interfered. Um, but because I was, you know, a, a good guy and, you know, I had a lot of knowledge, there was some exceptions made. Um, I had a very good friend um, whose father was a very powerful member and he went to bat for him. He goes, hey, the kid wants to improve himself. Well, you know, he's still going to work, but, you know, he needs the time off. They had no choice but to do what he said. He was, I mean, he was a very high-ranking member of the Can Chicago. You say who? I can't. <laughs> okay. Okay. I can't. A lot of family still alive and stuff, but um, okay. good, good people, you know. So how how did you end up getting the the no show job? Who provided that, or can you say on the that? Boys, or? yeah, the boys did. Um, the outfit. Uh, yeah, the outfit did. Um, political connections. I got um, the mayor of. Niles, Illinois, which was the town next to where I grew up with. Um, he was a Greek guy. Um, he was pretty well connected with, with well, I'll refer to as the boys. And um, he arranged it. And they kind of understood, but there were still some straight arrows that worked for the county. It was a county job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'd report me to who was the, it was the Forest Preserve District, actually. And the guy that ran the president of the Fort, Forest Preserve di District was a guy named Dick Phelan. Dick Phelan was another guy that was, was pretty crooked. Um, I haven't seen much about it, but, and until I do, I will probably keep it private. But, yeah, the guy was heavily involved with, with, with these, uh, with the guys that I worked with. And Damn. he was, uh, yeah. <laughs> he kind of he got the message after a year of you know having to sign in and stuff. Then it just became a strictly no show job. So I think you, at one point, and maybe it was an interview or on the article too. You said that Tony Accardo's sister had worked there too. Yeah, she did. It was funny when uh, um, the first year I worked there, I worked at the headquarters. That's how good of a job it was. I mean, I wasn't out cutting trees down like the rest of forestry was. I was in, in the headquarters. And his sister's name was Bessie. And Bessie, and people who, who know Tony Accardo and have seen Bessie, they, they looked, they were very similar in age, close in age. And they looked a lot alike. And now that he's dead, I'll joke, but I'd be like, I would tell guys that, you know, they knew it's Bessie Accardo, guys that were at the at the headquarters. Um, that's Tony Accardo's sister. I said, I know. And she'd tell me some great stories. Um, the, the best is she wanted to date Al Capone's brother, Bottles. I forget his first name, but Tony told, tells her, if you 
if you dare date that bottles, I'll kill him. So she didn't date, you know, bottles Capone, but that's how she was very, she was well beyond her retirement age. Um, but you know, and she didn't have to work. A lot of people question the thing, but if you go and look at Cook County Forest Preserve employees, and there's a database somewhere, you know, Bestia Cardo will show up. Um, <laughs> same thing with um, Rob's article. When I, you know, mentioned that my friend Jimmy LaValle got whacked on the golf course um, for turning, um, you know, for ratting on, on the on, on the outfit, um, it was questioned by his son. And his son said, no, 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 my father wasn't killed. Well, his son was a little boy when it happened. So, of mm -hmm. course, they probably, you know, it's a tough thing to say, well, your dad got shot in the head three times. Um, so he he didn't know. And we did our due diligence. And, yeah, it came up there that, you know, he was shot. They buried it. You know, they buried it under the rug. Family tried to get rid of it as best they could. Right. But some... Um, a couple websites had the information, you know, right when he was putting, guys walked out of the bushes, shot him in the head, and um, and that's how his demise came about. Damn. So, I mean, you were definitely involved, well, not deeply involved with a lot of the higher-up guys, but you would see a, a lot of these guys around with the, you know, the Chicago outfit bosses. Who, who were some of them that you uh, that you'd seen or talked to or that you can talk about? Quite a few. Um I think um, a couple of them are still alive. One of them is still alive. But no one knows DeFranzo recently died. John DeFranzo, he was elevated to boss back in the um, mid-2000s until we, Marco D'Amico, Dominic Cortina, my aunt's brother through marriage. It was my father's brother's wife, Joe, Joe Spa, Spadavecchio. Um, he was part of the bookmaking End of the mob. He ended up dying in prison for you know not only bookmaking, but they get you on tax evasion, and everything else. But that's all he really was was an old school bookmaker who rose through the ranks. You know these guys. You know I know guys that got arrested and went to the federal penitentiary. And you know bookmaking wasn't the main charge, but if you were bookmaking, you were evading taxes. Nobody was paying taxes on this money, right? So you yeah. know you're gonna get nailed for tax evasion. Did you uh, see that <clears throat> recent thing? I'm sure you probably did with uh, Nick Calabrese. He recently died. Did you ever know him or his family at all? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, we used to see them, and, and um, boxing was still big in Chicago. They were fight fans. and We'd see them at um, the Aragon Ballroom or the Odium um, Sports Arena. Um, but, yeah. Calabrese, you know, it's a, just a, a weird story. I mean, it's the only story I heard of where, you know, your, you know, your father wants you whacked and, you know, and it's just like, you know, to hear that your dad wants you killed, is, you know, kind of, you know, who knows to say what I would do if my dad wanted me killed. I mean, right. <laughs> my dad wasn't that kind of guy, but would I kill him first? I mean, <laughs> well, he's dead. What, what, what does it matter what he says? But I find it interesting. It's intriguing that Family Secrets trial with, um, uh, you know, the Family Secrets trial where they're, it's something that I never saw when I was there. There was no guy known for ratting while I was actively working for these guys. It was just they, they ran things the, the way they did in the old days. They, you know, you keep quiet. You don't rat. We'll take care of you. We'll get you out. If you have to do some time, you do the time. You know, nowadays guys don't want to spend a week in jail, let alone five years. Yeah, so I'm sure that when that Family Secrets came around, I mean, that was the, the first time that the outfit ever had an informant. Am I right on that? Right, right, yeah. So, so I'm, you weren't around for that then? No, you, I, was, was but I, I read a lot about it, you know, and, and they got a lot of information, you know, that was never known in the past. And along with information comes a lot of names. And so you see dozens of guys getting arrested that and nobody had any idea. I mean, for so many years, the outfit was able to, you know, the feds did have some idea, but they really never, there was no Donnie Brasco situation mm -mm. where, you know, you get names and dates and, and what they're doing and who they're killing. You didn't get any wiretapping. 
Um, did did they ever have an undercover infiltrate the outfit that you know of? I, I don't think so. I mean, unless it happened afterwards. I haven't really read much about that. It. No. Well, never... actually, I did an interview with a guy that he 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 somewhat did. I guess he was involved with the family secrets, and he he actually did. He was uh, his name's Lou Velosa. He was. I don't know if you see anything about him, but you know, I mean, it, it, it brings a bell. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure you can get guys in, but to get them into the the um the, the size of yeah to the bosses. I mean, everybody was on their toes. You right. know, it's yeah. you know, you had to. I mean, the guys that I worked for grew up with my father and knew the family through all those years. You know, you have um, a couple generations of connections. And they're usually not bringing the the guys in off the street that you know nobody knows. I mean, who's your father? Who's your mother? I mean, we didn't grow up together in Chicago, and that was the good thing about Chicago is that with one family, you were pretty much able to vet these people. Like you know who's coming in. You weren't putting ads on Craigslist. You know, look, you know, looking for new members. <laughs> Didn't the outfit as well have uh, police on their payroll that would do background checks and stuff like that? Oh, absolutely, you guys. <laughs> not not only that, but um, you know, and it really hasn't come out. But I have some knowledge, and um, maybe it will come out eventually. And I'm sure they know about it. But they they had some guys, some plants inside the organized crime unit, the OCU, um, the Chicago organized crime unit. They had guys in there that were feeding the, the the boys, as I call them, information. Those guys weren't all saints, you know. I mean, listen, everybody was chasing a buck. And to make that money, you, maybe you did some things that were unethical or just outright wrong. <laughs> but, you know, or you're going to, you know, are you going to live like um, Ray Liotta says, you know, you're just going to become another schmuck. <laughs> So, I mean, when you were doing all this stuff, ultimately you were, you left the life I know. And, uh, I mean, are you able to talk about that? Cause you I mean, yeah. you, you never, you, like you said, you never were convicted of anything like a felony wise. So now you're able to talk about this stuff. I mean, sure. but I mean, yeah. it, it, what ultimately left and made you leave the, the outfit? <clears throat> well, you know, um, it was, the first thing was my father had a bad stroke. And so, um, because he was, you know, a good guy and well-respected, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to help my father take care of him as a man, man, I give him showers and stuff. Um, the next thing was, was that I had small children, a wife now, and I saw some guys, one of my high school buddies, his name's Nick Gio. Um, I did a, previous podcast with the guy that um, you mentioned earlier and Nick Gio when he was a junior in high school he was younger than me came up to me he's like man can you get me in I'm like in what you know oh, can you can get me in my, my buddy you know I was really good friends with his brother Harry Harry had some dealings with it was like a fence for us he was my age so I introduced Nick to Jimmy LaValle and um Unfortunately, well, you know, I feel bad for the people. I never killed anybody. I never even hit anybody. Oh, yeah, I hit a couple guys. <laughs> but, um, and hit when I mean, you know, like, like hit, not, not, not hit. No, 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 not the <laughs> You gun. can take that, yeah, two different ways. <laughs> um, but he did two contract killings um, under the orders of uh, some made guys. And he's um, spending two life terms. He, either he's at Marion or Leavenworth. They'll move guys sometimes, but he was locked up with John Gotti, but he went to prison when he was about 23. He's probably 56 now, and he got two life sentences plus, you know, 20 years each. I mean, he's never getting out of prison. No. And there's a guy that, um, you know, looking back at it, and if I never introduced him to anybody, maybe his life would have turned different. I was a guy with a heart. You know, when guys told me they didn't have the money to pay, I'd say I'd always offer them, hey, listen, let's work on a deal. I understand. 
times are tough. You know, I wasn't trying to bullshit the guy. I said, hey, let's make a deal. What can you afford every week? Well, you know, I don't want maybe a hundred dollars. I go, wait a second. You're you're betting two thousand, three thousand dollars a weekend, but you can afford to pay a hundred dollars a week. And that's a little ridiculous. You're betting with money you don't have, which most people did. Wow. And I'd say, could you do like five hundred a week? Oh no, man, it's that's my whole paycheck. I'm like, all right, listen, two fifty. He's like, I'm telling them all I can do is afford a hundred. I'd go back to the office. I'm like, well, how do you guys want to handle it? Because I'd always tell everybody, listen, make the deal with me. I'm the nice guy because the guys that are coming after me, they're not nice like me. And I was being as honest as I could be with them. These guys are going to come and they're going to break your freaking arm. Um, and plus, you're betting over your head and more money than you have. So, you know, that's a, a no-no. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, so I never had to deal any hardcore way with anybody. I I, I really didn't. And... Um, you know, I heard some stories. I mean, you know, busted fingers or, you know, a busted kneecap. Not that that's something light, but that's what they do to you. You know, they bust your kneecap. You know, so you need to go to the doctor and you're on crutches. And because your friends are betting too. And they're like, what happened? Oh, dude, I couldn't pay. They, you know, they busted my kneecap. Well, the other guys that are betting see that. And they're like, I'm paying. <laughs> So, message. Yeah, you send the message. But I never sent the message personally. Um, no, one guy got smart with me, and I grabbed him. Right, he was getting smart. I mean, like, like I'm the asshole. Um, excuse my language, but you know, that's basically it. I grabbed him around the throat. You know, it's, you know, and I was pissed. I'm like, what, what? But that's as far as it went. Right. No, I mean, from what you tell me, I mean, it seems like you were definitely a reasonable guy. But like you said, with the other people, I mean, are you know, like with the guys that would go after the guys, I mean, that's that was their job, I guess, for people that wouldn't pay up and people that were betting, especially with the mafia, the Chicago outfit, whatever you want to call it, man. They're you know what you're getting into. I mean, oh, exactly. you know, if you don't pay, I mean, you're yeah. gonna get screwed, man. They ain't the, the bank or nothing like that. We yeah, you had your ball breakers, you had your hitmen. I mean, everybody had a job, and that's why my job was, you know, take the bets and pay the winners and collect from the losers. And, you know, I never got involved. Guys got involved in side businesses, selling blow and, you know, selling weed. It was illegal. And I just never got into that aspect of it. I was making enough money. I didn't want to risk it. And that was taboo. To the guys I worked with, drugs were, you know, a big taboo. Some of the bigger guys were doing it without the knowledge. That's very true. In movies, it's portrayed when yeah. you're doing drug deals. But now, or when I left, they found that, you know, drugs was very lucrative. So they did oh, get into the drug dealing business. Yeah, that's for damn sure. I mean, you see a lot of guys that got busted for it, even back in the old days, too. I mean, there was definitely guys that were getting busted for it. But, you know, it was always said, hey, you're not supposed to be doing that shit. But either way, they still tend. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. It is. <laughs> so, I mean, when you approach the Chicago outfit to leave, what, did you get any pushback, or what was your process of approaching these guys and saying, hey, I want out? Actually, it was my father that was a big help um, and his friends because, you know, let's face it, he had some guys that by the time he was 59 years old, those guys were, you know, higher-ranking members. And um, it was a little bit of me saying, hey, you know, I want to relocate to Florida. And then my father having a couple meetings with some guys and saying, let's face it, it's getting hot. Um I want to get my kid out. You know, he's my son. I've got grandchildren now. You know, I've never really liked the business that he, he did. He made money. It was a way to, you know, provide for his family. But at this point, you know, and when I say that my father spoke to some guys, these were these were the guys. You know, the guys that um, Pat Marcy was one of them. And if Pat said, you know, they called me Pops back then. You know, once you get a nickname, you know, you're kind of associated with them. Yeah. Pat Murray said, Pops is moving to Florida, guys. And that was it. The and hell? we packed up. I had a nice Crown Vic touring sedan, and I hooked a U-Haul up to the back of it, um, threw the family in there. I didn't rush. You know, I, I stopped book booking for like six months and prepared, you know, got all my stuff together and moved down to Sarasota, Florida with – probably had you know several hundred thousand dollars when i moved down here you know I, I i spent a lot of money up there you know you're making good money 
you you know you spend what you make you have a good time <laughs> i used to come down to florida for you know august was a big month before a football season where i get off so i would come down to longboat key the family had a condo right off of sarasota here on longboat key my family actually um and i spent a month you know with my wife and, and daughters and we'd have a great time and so i chose sarasota in 95 which was just a small you know because i spent my childhood vacations here and then as i got older you know with my family i liked the area and it was just a small sleepy resort town and it turned into fort lauderdale now <laughs> it really has they just, they just keep on expanding huh oh it's crazy <laughs> Well, no, I mean, that's that's good that you were able to step away without having any repercussions or anything like that. I mean, your father really helped you out. I mean, who knows if he didn't put in that word. I mean, I don't know how much pushback they'd give you, but either way, it, it is what it is. And you got out and now sports gambling is illegal or legal now. So, yeah, and that's this thing, you know, that's this thing about it. I mean, I, I made a mistake. Um, because I know a lot of guys that were successful bookmakers that moved out to Vegas at the same time that I moved out to Florida and got into the business and, you know, out in Vegas and this business in Vegas is now turned into this national business of, you know, and you see the commercials, but MGM DraftKings fan dual Caesars, do I need to go yeah. on and on? No, I, we, we know we see them yeah. and I'm just amazed at what's happened to this business which for me began in this leaky roofed old smelly warehouse. It smelled like oil and gasoline with folded card tables, whiteboards and chalkboards. Now until you sit in the sports book, you're nice and comfortable. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the sports book back in the eighties and nineties, going to Caesars and, you know, hanging out. It was my favorite sports book or the Las Vegas Hilton and just hanging out at the sports book and saying, God, this is great, too. But it's not like this everywhere. Well, guess what? It's like this almost everywhere now. I mean, <laughs> I live in Florida. I have to bet either offshore with a local guy. Um, you know, I have friends get that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that live, <clears throat> excuse me, that live in other parts of the country. And I'm partners with them. You know, um, they're going to have to pay taxes on that money, that income. Um, the past five years, six years ago, I had a fairly bad year. I think I lost something like twenty-seven thousand dollars for the year. Damn. Since then, I've pretty much been a you know. Since then, yeah, I've definitely profited every year. Last year, I actually made a little over forty thousand dollars, and that ended at the Super Bowl of this year. I go Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is my year. Right. So forty grand is what I made bookmaking. Um, I mean. You still have now the FBI is calling. Forty grand is what I made betting. What I made book <laughs> we'll keep that as no. I wasn't booking any bets, but I made about forty grand um Damn. Bet, which isn't Boy, huge, which isn't huge, but um I, I was a good saver. I have some like real estate, some rental properties that I utilize that were all bought with with um um legitimate proceeds. You know, my wife has a corporate job. We invest. I don't invest any money in the stock market. I don't own any crypto. Um, this is just a disclaimer, all this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if, um, you know, I pay my taxes, I, I become a just an upstanding citizen now. Right. You just changed it all around. <laughs> you had well, to. You know, I have grandchildren now. I mean, my grandson wants to go play catch and everything else. I'm waiting, you know, I don't hide it. My daughter's now, they've seen the other podcasts I've done. They've read the articles. Um, until this all came out three years ago, it was still quiet. I didn't ever told my daughters. They had no idea. <laughs> really? I told them I work for the county. And then we moved down here. And they're like, yeah, but after you worked down here, I mean, we after you moved down here, what did you do? You never really went to work. Ah, I, you know, home-based businesses. <laughs> I, I, I got an eBay store. I <laughs> eBay that, store. Yeah. yeah, I'm lying to my kids, you know. I mean, just. You know, it never leaves you. I mean, I, no. I'm a straight shooter, but, you know, you just don't. These are daughters. Right. Um, as, as my buddy Dave Sherapan, he's a real good um, personality. I call him out in Vegas. He does a real good job with sports shows. Um, we're girl dads. It's a lot different than being a boy dad, you know. I mean, we're girl. We, we've got girls, no sons. 
No, I got a little girl right now too. Uh, no, no sons either. So no. <laughs> you still it's have not... time though. You're a lot younger than I am. Yeah, I'm twenty. Uh, just turned twenty three. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> guess you got your whole life ahead of you. I'm just trying <laughs> to enjoy what I got left. <laughs> yeah, we all got to do that though. You never know what what happens. Oh, man. you'll be so fifty. Now, you'll be fifty nine one day, Aaron. But trust me, <laughs> you know, it, it, it'll it'll come. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But going just going back to your question of sports betting, you know, I I think um. I, I think I've made it clear before, and you know, I'm on t- Twitter a lot. You can find me at at Mergis John, just my last name first. Um, and um, I tweet a lot of stuff. I see guys like Jeff Benson who runs Circa Sports, really it's the the best run sports book I think in the world. Um, everybody, everybody's welcome. They don't limit guys, but um, you know, he gets in some uh, in some. Uh, tweet uh, wars with the guys at DraftKings FanDuel. It's very interesting because I have friends that, you know, they'll bet, you know, maybe two, three, four, five hundred a game and they win and they win and they win. And the next thing you know, they go to put a $200 bet in. And it's a sorry, um, your limit is $30. Really? Max. So they <laughs> limit the, the batters, which is something that's not good for business. And no. when this is all said and done, from what I've seen, There'll only be maybe four big ones left for sports books with apps. I mean, there's just not enough room. A lot of companies getting bad reputations. Yeah, I mean that's that's that that is a shitty end of it. You know, I guess from how you guys ran your things back then and how they're doing it now, they're limiting people. I mean, that's people ain't gonna like that. No, <laughs> they're gonna hate that they, shit. They hate it, and that's why you have to have in in the business we call it multi. You know multiple outs you have to have like eight sports books and i'm already banned you know not even limited but they just won't take my action i can't deposit into the offshores that they they have now but um there's some new ones that are opening up that actually one i consulted for and one of the deals i made was for the next five years you'll take all my bets and give me a thousand dollars per game um max bet you, you can limit me to a thousand a game because i have other outs but that was part of the deal and i had to wait two days for that answer and they figured hey you know what he knows a lot of sharp guys it's not just me when you talk about sports betting i built up such a network of of contacts mm-hmm. that i'll call if i have a question about a game or i'm not sure you know a lot of people think i do this alone i don't when i when i bet you know it, it's a group of us that yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bet our own accounts, but we take like a consensus of, yeah, we like UCLA or we like UConn today. So that's how that works. But um, I don't like where the future's going. Um, you know, uh, there's only a few guys like yourself. You know, you run a clean, like, like the old timers, but you run a clean podcast. You know, you, you, you got you, it's uh, you have good guests on. And I'm not bragging or anything, but but choosing me made the right choice. <laughs> um, but and there's and there's a couple other podcasts that I do that I that I enjoy. That I think that's where the business is headed more towards hearing the real stories from the real guys yeah. about what what really goes on. That's and true. I, and DraftKings and FanDuel definitely doesn't. They don't want me or BetMGM. They don't want me as a guest telling everybody that 98% of your betters are losers because that's bad for business. Oh, hell but yeah. If you what? Google it, you know, if you there's papers done, guys have written theses about it. Yeah, you could have one year or two good years. Um, like this past two weeks, I haven't had the greatest two weeks of my life um, of picking games. But I do have clients to answer to, but I don't offer, you know, t- you know, Vegas Dave style five thousand dollar whale play. I offer her, I gotta give everybody a chance. Listen, you can tail all my bets all year long. Every one of the bets, and I'll provide you with the betting ticket. And you know, you, you'll see it. For one year, which I extended to two years, and but you you've got to give me a year to earn that money because it's like a market. You know, right. yeah, you yeah. can have a great day, but then the next day you can, you know, lose 40%. Right. So over the year, I'll win. But the, you know, the March Madness tournament's been tough. The conference tournaments were tough. 
just hope today's an easy day. Hey, let me ask you a question. You said you had a clothing line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do right behind me called invest in yourself clothing. That's just a few of my shirts and stuff that I have on there, but yeah. Any I'm, lids? Cause I'm a big lid guy. You know, I might have to order some. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can get you a custom hat. I mean, you know, awesome. I'll, I'll send you some pictures and stuff and we'll, uh, We'll make it happen. I mean, no, that's awesome, and I, I appreciate it. No, I, I was just, I was curious. You, you mentioned it. I'm not, you know, trying to plug you or anything, but I was, I, you know, <laughs> I know that after this, you probably got some more podcasts to do and everything else. You seem like a busy guy, but um, yeah, yeah. Did, did we uh, miss on anything? No, we covered everything, man. So I appreciate you coming, and I'm glad you, you got anything else you want to promote, or I mean, you, you kind of promoted that that you just did. But is there anything else that you got in the works, or anything else coming up? Yeah, there's been talk about, you know, like um, maybe not a whole book, but, uh, you know, a chapter dedicated to, you know, my story. That's what I was um, going to ask. Guy, yeah, a guy doing a, a, a book in Chicago uh, about awesome. the Chicago outfit. Yeah, because not too much is known except like the family secrets and everything else. But, um, you know, my end will have to do with sports betting. Yeah. And like I said, the Wild West of sports betting. Mm -hmm. And as I said in Rob's article, it was either us or Vegas. And that's yep. the only options you had or New York. If you lived in New York, the cities, you know, but well, other than that, man, I think we covered everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I, um, we'll have to do another one sometime. Um, especially if something breaks in Chicago, um, and it has to do with guys. I know I'll DM you mm -hmm. and let you, Hey, listen, you know, you, did you see the news? I got something I can I can talk about something now. Well, what'd you guys think? John's got a hell of a story. He was around a lot of made men and bosses of the Chicago outfit. He also put in a number of years as a bookie. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this video. Please share it with anybody that you think will enjoy it. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe if you want to get more interviews like this. If you want to support me and my clothing brand, I got t-shirts, hoodies, and beanies all on my website. I'll be sure to put my clothing brand link in the video description. Also, at the end of this video there'll be a playlist of all my other mafia interviews i've done and lastly i'll bring up my documentary series i've been working on about the american mafia there's 11 episodes all together and each episode is about a different crime family check out this trailer to get more information this life is very twisted you never know when it's your time to go one day you're putting in work with someone and the next day they're taking you out in our days it was very quiet, you know, nobody ever talked about this, you know, nobody glamorized it. It was all like hush hush. It's not a glamorous life. And again, it's not what you see in Goodfellas. It's not what you see in Casino. Some days you were dead broke. Some days you had two grand in your pocket. It wasn't every day. You know, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it is to go wake up six o'clock and go to work. Work? What the fuck is that? I wasn't going to work. Even bosses get murdered in this life. There was younger guys underneath him, and he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess. He was coming out of the card game, and unfortunately, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times. People knew me to tell you, I like to use a bat a lot. If I had to shoot you, I'd shoot you too. I've done that. This life requires many mixed personalities. You have to wear many hats in this life to try and survive. You become four or five different people all at once, and... You gotta go home and be a dad and a husband. You gotta go to work and do your job. You gotta be out in the street and be a gangster. The Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. That life there is done. Uh, today oh, you have to be legitimate yeah, today. Man. But you're gonna be an idiot to want right. to be a hula today. Because Jail time's now like 100 years for doing right. nothing. Yeah, you, you'll be dead in prison for life or in the witness protection program. I don't know anybody. Now, when the Mafia turned their back on me, I know everybody. There was the big flip of the Gambino underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Here he is signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. It was supposed to be a secret organization. He was a very, very, very violent guy. No question about it. Albert Anastasia, he was a Brooklyn guy. He was probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. Michael Francis, his father, Sonny, uh, was a really tough guy, but he really raised his son right. Son, if you want to see a gangster, that's Sonny Francis. And John Cena don't compliment anybody. This is a documentary series about the American Mafia. It includes 11 different crime families. Each episode is about a different one. The crime families include the Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese, the Gallo Crew, Chicago Outfit, the Philadelphia Mafia, the Patriarca, the Traficante Crime Family, and the Jewish Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel to watch each episode as they come out.